morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, good, looks like it sound is good enough. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Um, I'll put in the, the chat, the chant that we'll be doing this morning, the suffusion with the divine abidings, but I think I'll wait just a moment because once I put it in, people who arrive afterward won't see it. And while we're waiting to begin, this is a good time to, in a relaxed way, just take in the folks here together. And I know it doesn't always make sense for people to have their video on, and that's totally okay. But uh, if it does make sense, this is a good time to have the video going so people realize there are people out there that we're sitting with and practicing with even if you're just having the video on for a couple minutes. Just to say hi. People are also welcome to put something in the chat at the beginning. Once we're doing the meditation, it's nice to let go of any reading of the chat or writing anything in the chat. And also just a piece of business. Uh, most of you know this, but uh, we are recording these and uh, one of the reasons we ask to, uh, everyone to keep themselves muted is it means that the screen is just on me, the speaker. And so that preserves your privacy because the recording and Rachel uh, does edit out any times that somebody's screenshot might show up in the recording. So don't worry about that. And very appreciative to all the volunteers, including Nancy Bowler, who's here today. And Nancy will be facilitating the breakup of small groups right at the end for about 15 or 20 minutes. So if you want to connect with some of the community members, just stay on the Zoom meeting. And uh, after we have a transition, Nancy will come on and walk you through how to get into your breakout groups. And it's just a chance to say hi and share some of what's arising in your own practice and what's resonating from the talk. Um, with other a few other people in the community. So we're going to go ahead and begin now with the chant that I just put in the chat for those who don't know it. Sometimes we refer to it as the four quarters chant. Other times we call it the suffusion with the divine abidings, these four beautiful emotions. We can think of these four emotions of loving kindness and compassion appreciative joy, or here it's translated as gladness and equanimity as the qualities, the animating qualities when the heart is wise. So that's how you know that wisdom is moving, governing, in a sense, your heart is you find that your activities, the activities of your life are being sort of expressed through love, uh, basic kindness and tender heartedness of compassion and the, do the joy of appreciation and the balance of equanimity. So let's do this chant to begin and then we'll sit for about 30 minutes. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, 
with a mind imbued with compassion, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, <clears throat> and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with gladness, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world <clears throat> with a mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with equanimity, Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. <clears throat> and take the time you need to settle, do what you can. Of course, the first thing we'll recognize as we settle is how much is moving. And we learn not to let that or need for that to be a problem, that sensations are moving, of course, and sounds are moving. And even when the eyes are closed, the visual field is alive with change, with movement, colors and light. Thoughts are moving. The sensitive heart, the feeling, emotional feeling in the heart is also like a flow, a movement. Entering the stream of our experience right here and now. And we're exploring, we're not demanding, but we're exploring the possibility that it's both safe, safe enough, and it's helpful, useful to soften and relax and with wholesome quality of interest 
enter open to the stream of the present moment, the activity moving here and now. Allowing any armor, any defensiveness to fall away. We're exploring this exposure to the present moment, to what's moving here and now. And we don't even need to defend ourselves by having some idea, drawing some conclusion about what's happening or about how I'm practicing. Of course, those ideas, those thoughts will arise, but no need to cling to those ideas or fixate because we're learning <clears throat> to notice that thoughts come and go just like everything else. Thoughts come and go and the meaning that the thoughts point to that comes and goes as well. So really the working ground of our practice is we're bringing together two things. We're relying on the stability of present moment awareness, or we could call it a deep valuing of being present, opening to the way it is. And we're bringing that stability of present moment awareness together with the pointing out instructions or teachings from the Buddha. The Buddha's teachings on wise, the wise way of understanding that everything is changing, for example, is one of the gifts, the teachings from the Buddha. So we use that bit of information that everything is changing and that in this way experience isn't in a sense worthy of grasping because it's a changing process. It's not really personal coming and going thoughts, sensations coming and going due to so many causes and conditions. So these simple teachings that everything's changing, not satisfying really, not really personal, not really referring back to a fixed entity. We take these teachings Combine them with the stability of present moment awareness, this continuity, deep valuing of present moment awareness. And we learn to relax here with that reflection from the teachings and the stability, continuity of present moment awareness. And we could call this learning how to be intimate with the changing nature of this experience here. Learning to see clearly, learning to feel things as they are and the letting go, the deepening of understanding and the deeper letting go is a natural consequence that arises because we're willing to be present and learning to experience this present moment 
experiencing in terms of it changing, in terms of it not really satisfying the sense of me. I never find that I'm completely satisfied and noticing this whole process of being as impersonal. Everything is coming and going according to so many causes and conditions. So let's continue now in silence.
Be willing to begin again and again. Beginning again simply means acknowledging the reality of how it is for you right now. Oh yeah, the body's sitting. There is this activity of sensation, this activity of thought, thinking, this activity of feeling, emotional feeling. And these activities are being known here and now in the present moment. Can I enter this stream? Is there a way to relax and trust that these activities are being known here and now already? So it's less about me doing something and more about trusting what's already happening right here and now. This is being known. And we don't need to manage the knowing, we don't need to direct it. And we don't need to judge what it, whatever it is that's being known because any object, anything that's being known is fine. It's just the next thing being known. So if we notice some neurotic thinking, that's being known. If we notice a lot of calm, well, that's what's being known. And instead of trying to let go, the practice is more about being interested in the stream, the stream of our experiencing. This is being known, this is being known. Get really interested, learn how to be intimate, relax. And the letting go naturally happens just through this interest, this willingness to be close. So in this sense, <clears throat> it's our willingness to be exposed to the way it is right now that teaches the heart how to let go or even better, it's this exposure to the way it is that wears out our habits of struggling and resisting, controlling,
So in the sense, it's very ordinary truth of the way that it is right now is our main teacher. So we're willing to get close, willing to respect and in a way submit to the activity of the present moment. both interested and trusting relaxation. And don't be fooled, we don't need a different present moment than the one that's showing up right now. Even though that can be a very compelling idea. This moment is fine. Perfectly fine to open to this moment, even if it's apparently quite neurotic that the mind is up to. It's okay. This is being known. This is being felt. Can I relax? Can I be interested? Be close, closer. We say that Buddha awakens to Dhamma. So being awake, being clear and intimate with the way it is. And taking a moment, just the last minute or two and noticing any peace, any stability, any sense of release or ease that might have arisen from this practice. So that we're learning in a direct way that this practice is wholesome, helpful. The positive effects are real, as real as anything. And perhaps even opening the eyes for a few seconds before we begin to move. Noticing that sense of freedom or space or equanimity. And take your time 
to adjust your posture, do a little stretching. So nice to be with everyone this morning. So I've been finishing up, uh, planning to finish up these next couple of weeks, um, a series of talks, reflections on the Buddhist teachings on impermanence. And really the, you know, the summation of our whole practice is learning how to let life teach us the life of our experience or the exposure, as I was saying in the guided meditation. This is a passage from one of my teachers, Saida Utejaniya, who's a Buddhist monk from Burma and a highly regarded meditation teacher. And he said, we need to be aware of where our attention is and not get caught in focusing on or putting too much energy on any particular object. For example, you know, we often, when we're sitting, if there's some pain in the body, we put that object of pain front and center and, and in a way we stare at it like, oh, there's pain happening in my body. And it's almost like if I just stare at it, look at it hard enough, the pain will go away. And because that actually happens sometimes, we get in that groove, like that's the sum total of practice. We stare at an object, kind of like a parent staring down a child, you know, I'm bigger than you, you know, so awareness stares down different present moment happenings as if to prove to these things that are coming and going, you know, I'm bigger than you, you can't hurt me. Instead, uh, Saida Utejani, he says, spread your attention so you're seeing the full picture, both inside and out, emotionally, physically. When we practice in this way, it is called Vipassana, seeing what is and letting it be. So, you know, in terms of training or developing some useful mental muscles, it can be useful. And, you know, there are teachings in the Buddhist tradition where we do take up a very particular object of meditation and we keep our attention just on that object. So it's not that this doesn't have a place. It has a very important place. But where we're going is to what we could call the totality of the present moment. So I want you to do a little reflection with me right now, because, you know, we use these words like, or phrases like the present moment, as if we know what they mean. <laughs> so let's just talk, right? Because we all have the so-called present moment. So what is the present moment? Because the intellectual idea we might have about the present moment is it's just a series of specific objects right? Like a meteor shower of objects. There's this object and there's that object. And that's how the world of experience looks from a object oriented perspective, where we're rarefying or highlighting that there are objects of experience. But when we're instead, we're getting this teaching from Saito Tejaniya, such as from him, it's just part of the whole path of having more of a broad and deep inclusive awareness. So the present moment itself is the object. All of, it's like a, the swirling of the currents in the ocean. We could get fixated on a particular current, a particular happening, or we could in a sense feel into the totality of the ocean. So it's not denying that there are specific currents or specific things in the ocean, but we're seeing it as a totality. And so just notice this now as we're reflecting about the present moment. Notice the present moment as a totality, 
like we're growing with awareness, we're growing intimate so that what's here and now there's nothing outside because everything's being included. There's no inside or outside, no duality of good and bad. There's just this being known. And it's really important to hear this teaching first, of course, intellectually, we get it in terms of the words and what the words point to, but then we reflect and we actually try it out. Oh yeah, the present moment isn't a bunch of stuff. It's this totality. It's this all inclusive totality. This is being felt, being known and it's alive. It's not a static totality, right? Is that your experience of being sort of frozen? No, it has, it's, it's really defined by movement, by change. We can't actually grasp the present moment. So this is really the, this is the opening like we, in terms of what we consider in early Buddhism, our refuge, we're a human being. It's not easy being a human being. We look for a refuge. We come across these teachings. The Buddha, like in early Buddhism, the refuge is put in code, right? Buddhist code, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. So that we have this quality of wakefulness. That's what Buddha means. And this word Dhamma, the way it is, so wakefulness to the way it is. And out of that is this possibility of Sangha, wholesome action or wholesome activity. Or these four divine abodes that we chanted at the beginning for those who are here right at the beginning of loving kindness and compassion and appreciative joy or gladness and equanimity, these that activity, our life animated by love, that's Sangha. So we have the refuge of waking up to the way it is, Buddha, Dhamma, and therefore being able to live animated by love. That's our refuge. That's what we take refuge. So we don't look for protection and you know, it's nice to have a nice house, no doubt. And it's nice to have good food and it's nice to have good friends and all of those ordinary things that we on a relative level take refuge in, right? Having good health, warm clothes for those of us in Minnesota, right? But all of those relative things that bring some support and bring in some comfort and safety are not reliable because things change. So ultimately we need a refuge that can be counted on. And it's sort of provocative to say, okay, here you go. Here's, your, here's a refuge that will really take care of you. Take care of you when you're dying, take care of you when you're losing what you love, when you have ill health and a lot of physical discomfort. We have this refuge of Buddha being intimate with Dhamma and the wholesomeness, the wholesome activity that can come out of that willingness to meet the world, the inner world and the outer world. And uh, of course, <laughs> we, don't, we don't quite believe it. You know, we, we hear it and maybe we're, I'm guessing we're all to some degree interested in that refuge, interested enough to practice a little because what we do with like, once we hear about the refuge, then we practice it. So like today we sat down as a group and we recognize this capacity to be awake, to be alert and relaxed, right? That's kind of emphasize that at the beginning of the guided meditation, can we be alert and relaxed to the way it is, to this totality of the body and mind, the activity of the body and mind, what's moving here, what's alive with change. Can we be, learn how to be intimate? And at the end of the set, I just invited us like, do you notice 
in some way having been changed, like what's happening now, having been changed by that work we did for those 35 minutes or so. Because that's the only way we'll get a sense of, is this a path, a trustworthy path? We have to hear the instructions. We have to do our best to live out those instructions. And then we have to notice what's gotten set in motion because of that. And it's, you know, relatively subtle. So we have to really listen. We have to tune. What is living in me? Having done that, what's alive in me, in my, this activity of my body and mind that was different, is a little different than before. What kind of seeds have been planted and what are the consequence of those seeds being planted and how I'm active. And we begin to discern this difference between what in Buddhism we call samsara, the cycling of suffering, where we have the conditioned view to see, take things personally. And, um, and when I'm, you know, when that's the frame, and I'm perceiving my experience through that frame, this is happening to me, a permanent sense of a me, right? Then the way I relate, the way I act, it's really animated by greed, hatred, and aversion, we say. These are the three poisons, as they're sometimes called in early Buddhism, that naturally, unavoidably arise out of self-centered views, right? There's no way to be greedy and hateful and deluded or distracted in denial when without self-view, without a self-centered view. What would it be to be hateful from a non-self point of view, from a all-inclusive way of being? No, it's just hate comes when we've located ourself in a fixed location, me, and then feel threatened because of that fixed location of me, then things do appear to me to be threatening. And I hate that. And I want to get rid of them or ignore them or, you know, hate them. So we have to make that connection like in samsara, in our ordinary activity of suffering, of being tight and being afraid and clinging and grasping and struggling with life and our kids and our lovers and the world around us. We want to see that appropriately because of how this mind has been conditioned. I'm taking it all very personally and taking it personally is very much related to feeling, trusting the motivation of greediness and hatefulness fear, distract, wanting to be distracted, wanting, uh, using denial, you know, just think about how many, so much of our economy is actually all about helping us disconnect. <laughs> and then so the being animated by greed, hatred and delusion, I plant seeds because those animating, those motivating qualities in my mind, my heart, they're tight, and they make everybody else around me tight. So more suffering. And when there's more suffering, when I'm really hurting, I'm very much compelled to continue to see things from a self-centered point of view. It's really hard when we're pushed into the corner, you know, the proverbial corner because we're hurting so much emotionally in all levels. It's very hard to be curious in an open way about what's happening. We, so that self-centeredness in part, that self-centered view is being driven by suffering. Because we're suffering, we feel so certain there's a me who's suffering. And once again, my mind grasps 
identifies with the motivating forces of greed, hatred, and delusion, because that's what makes sense from the self-centered view. And this is what drives this. Uh, when uh, my partner, Common Grounds co-founder, and I have been watching a really powerful uh, documentary, maybe some of you saw it, I forget how long ago it happened, but it's not that old, by Henry Louis Gates, some of you know, a uh, very well-known professor, I think of history at Harvard. And uh, he did this series on the reconstruction. So that's the period right after the Civil War, if you don't know, and really interesting place in our history. And uh, just the hopefulness for a relatively short period of time right after the war and uh, Northern Army still sort of making stuff happen in the South. And then sort of the reassertion of greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, and how that comes to be. And it, I think given, you know, it's, it's such a tragic part of our history, those years, you know, 20, 30 years after the Civil War, from the hopefulness to the re-entrenchment of the hate. And, and, and just that dance between the economic interests of the Southern white folks and, uh, and the sort of systemic hatred of people who are different, like the African-Americans. And, uh, and when we see something like that happen in history, right? It, the outer world is just the expression at the outer expression of our mind, our own heart and mind. And how to have, we really want to respect the, like a wheel rolling down a hill or something round rolling down a hill. It has a lot of momentum and samsara, self-centered view, leading the mind to align with greed, hatred, and delusion as our motivating, animating forces in our lives. And that those motivating forces of greed, hatred, and delusion, they hurt, they're tight, right? They make the heart tight. And because we're tight, we cause harm to ourselves and we spread the harm. We plant seeds out there. We act out the tightness, right? And that pain of being tight supports the continued delusion, the continued ignorance, the addiction to self-centeredness. Because I'm hurting, I'm pretty sure there's a me because I'm hurting, right? And so we're more compelled to use greed, hatred, delusion to deal with our suffering. But all it does is plant more and more seeds. And this just keeps rolling in our cultures, in our communities, and in our hearts and minds. And so the hardest thing in the world is we have to get interested in samsara, right? That's the antidote or that's the path of awakening. Buddha, this capacity we all have to be intimate with Dhamma that as a refuge is what's moving here. And you know what's moving here is everything past. Like in Buddhism, there's a kind of simple teaching. You want to know the past? Well, notice what's moving right now. Because what's moving right now, both out, or there, you know, out there in our communities and also in here in our hearts, this is the cumulative expression of the past. Where else would the past exist? It exists by what's moving right now. Now, obviously, some of that is suppressed or hidden or subtle, but it's all here because there's nowhere else for it to be. This is the expression of the past. And you see this, like a, just using this example of racism in the United States, you know, a lot of the way that we're conditioned in our culture is to think, you know, that happened back there. But we are really the continuation of what happened back there. That's what who we are. And that's not just true in terms of racism in the United States, but just in terms of our own ancestral, you know, baggage. The, both in terms of the goodness of our ancestors and also the ignorance of our ancestors. We are the continuation of that. 
just like we're the continuation of, you know, millions of years of mammals on this planet. We're, we're kind of physically, genetically, the continuation of all of that and everything else. And it doesn't matter that we don't like it, you know, or wish it were different than it is because we have to align with the truth. Well, this is how it is. We are the continuation. The past does not exist except what's showing up right now in our world and in our hearts. And the world is just the, you know, cumulative, you know, cumulative expression of all of our hearts, all the ignorance and all the beauty we see in the world. And so the Buddhist path is to realize we have this capacity to be awake, which is why there's such a big deal in Buddhism about cultivating the stability of present moment awareness. We're basically screwed if we don't bring in, if we don't activate that capacity to be alert in a relaxed way. And this mindful presence really also includes a profound degree of humility because there's really no mindful presence without, because if we think we know what we're looking at or what we're opening to or what we're feeling, then we're affected by that idea of what we think, that expectation. So we really, and you'll see this as you develop your own practice, there's a way to open, to be actually interested and alert, but without having any without being fixated on any idea of what we're experiencing, what we're opening to. So like we might say, okay, I'm gonna to open to my body, but our idea of my body isn't contaminating my opening to the body. We still can have that idea. We can even use that word. Like some people might ask themselves a question silently in the mind, how's the body doing, right? But that doesn't have to skew how we're opening, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing, doesn't have to be affected by any baggage we have. That's why we often like in as a just as a training we use in Buddhism, early Buddhism, sometimes the four elements. So like when we're feeling the breath at the nostrils, you know, we'll use the earth element, and we'll feel the actual contact air touching the nostrils, right? just to help break the spell of my idea of breath. And no, no, there's just touching. Or we'll notice the temperature, like it's cool when it's coming in and it's a little warm when it's going out. Or we'll notice the sense of movement, like how it comes, feels the sinuses, feels like we feel that flow, what we could call motion. So these are what we mean. You don't have to learn this, but. It's just in early Buddhism, we broke it down in terms of the air element, that's movement, the temperature element or fire, right? The earth element, which is the hardness of touch or the softness of touch. And uh, the water element, which is a more cohesive uh, aspect of all of those elements coming together as the way it is. So we have to break the spell, right? Where Buddha, this humble, clear, relaxed presence, training, trusting, being intimate with the wildness, the inclusive wildness of the totality of the present moment, this activity of the body and the mind, and willingness to start over and over again. And this is how we break the spell of samsara, of not just doing the same thing, because you might sit every day for an hour, and you maybe you've done that for decades, but we could just be doing samsara. Actually, we could be doing samsara on steroids because there in the quietness of our room with the cell phone off, with our thinking mind, we could basically be relating from a self-centered point of view, looking and relating to our experience with greed, anger, and delusion, getting tight, the tightness, reinforcing the self-centeredness, looking at our experience with greed, anger, and delusion, getting tight. And we're sort of revving up that habit, what we call samsara, which is suffering. 
even though the idea we'd have is no, 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 I'm practicing to be free, but we're doing it from a self-centered point of view. That's why it's really important to understand that what mindfulness is. That right from the beginning, you know, the Buddha's path is a, is a wisdom path. So it isn't just about opening to the present moment. There is this place where new information comes in. So it's both the opening to the present moment, but including this new information. What I'm opening to is nature, not self. Right, so any of that habit of looking at my present moment experience from a self-centered point of view, that's not the practice. So we're, do we're doing both like that willingness to feel and to see what's happening, but to, and then we, you know, we specifically frame it as like, yeah, this is nature. This is just stuff happening as a counterweight to my habit of this is my body, this is my pain, this is my calm feeling. This is, you know, that habit of personalizing our experience. So when we step out of samsara, we do that by this willingness to be present with this new information. This is nature, not self. And by nature, that's kind of a code word that we use, especially these days in early Buddhism. And it just represents these things we've been studying this fall, that things are changing because experience, everything we experience is a flow. It is fundamentally, existentially, not capable of satisfying the idea of me because I never get solid ground. So I'm always looking for it from an egoic self-centered point of view. So when we say nature, we're, we mean it's changing, it's not satisfying, not worthy of grasping, and it's an impersonal process. That's what we mean when we say it's nature. And that's the information, like you get it now, like these words, my interpretation of the Buddhist teachings that I'm passing on to everybody and reminding myself as well. And then we use that information now because we can even while listening, we can be aware of the way it is right now. We can wake up Buddha being intimate with Dhamma, but we can see that even though it feels personal, what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing, that idea that it feels personal is also part of these impersonal causes and conditions that are being known. Oh yeah, that totality of the present moment and that begins to break the spell because the more we have that stability and continuity of present moment awareness with this new information there, you know you're doing it right when the heart starts to feel more and more dispassionate, more and more that sense of space as opposed like that, when I say that sense of space, that's opposing that sense of the opposite would be that sense of entanglement, getting entangled with our experience. Like when, even when we're sitting, always doing an adjustment, like, okay, I'll fix it, I'll bring this in. And it's almost like our meditation is all about getting to a nice place, getting to a nice place of calm that I have. I've gotten myself to this nice place of peace or calm and it's mine. And it's, it's not that there isn't calm in practice. There can be really beautiful, all kinds of beautiful states that arise in practice over time. But we're interested not in a particular a place or a particular experience because it's gonna be characterized by change, by being fundamentally unsatisfactory and that it's not personal anyway. So it's not a refuge. So by integrating this information into the stability of present moment awareness, the heart is getting transformed. The view is getting transformed from thinking that there's a me who's gonna get safety and in a permanent sense 
from my experience or finally I'll be safe. I'll attain some place like heaven where I'll be safe forever. It's going from that because that's what drives samsara. It's interesting in, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, the kind of metaphoric and mythological tradition, you know, the heavenly realms, the angelic celestial realms, they're just as much caught in this wheel of samsara as so-called beings in hell realms, right? It's just really nice until it isn't. It's just like hell is really bad until it isn't because things are changing. And even as a human being, hopefully we've uh, moved through some heavenly moments in our lives and maybe even heavenly periods in our life where things were mostly nice for us. And probably all of us have had definitely had hellish periods where things were really difficult, really hard to bear. Felt like it was too much. How can a heart meet this? Right? And where did that hellish place go? It changed. And that's really shocking when we really look at it, just like, where did that really nice feeling I had go? It's gone. And the more we study with the stability of awareness, this underlying nature of change, unsatisfactoriness, and personal nature this beautiful dispassion grows. And it's really a change of allegiance from being thinking that experience is gonna save me to realizing experience isn't gonna change me or isn't gonna save me. And that, that transition can be a little rocky, just so you know, but eventually realizing a letting go or a non-dependence. So this is interesting, this word Nibbana which we often think of as a, like a place like heaven, which is not how the Buddha uses that word Nibbana, right? It's a cooling, as I mentioned last week, a releasing. Think of it as an active, like I was reading an article by, uh, from Gil Fransdahl, a wonderful teacher and scholar, Buddhist scholar, but he used the example of a, a tight fist, hold it really tight, hold it tight, and it feels so good, that releasing, releasing, what is unnecessary, putting down the load. And as soon as somebody wants to own the releasing, we're back in samsara, you know, bottle it. So it's my releasing, my nibbana. Doesn't really make sense like that. Let me just read a passage from this article. Um, from Gil Fransdahl that I mentioned. He writes here, it's the article is uh, titled Entering the Stream. Nibbana refers, so remember the word Nibbana is just that ordinary word from the time of the Buddha, like the cooling of a fire that's gone out. That's really, it was just an ordinary word at the time. And just in case you don't know, Nibbana is the Pali equivalent of the Sanskrit word nirvana. So the same word, just different languages. Nibbana refers to the action of releasing, not to any subsequent state of peace, calm, or freedom. As an action, it is an activity, not a state, a process, not a result, an occurrence, not a thing one attains. Originally, the word Nibbana was not so much a name for the ultimate goal, but rather a simile used to describe liberation. As an action noun, Nibbana means the cooling or the going out, as in the cooling or going out of a fire or candlelight. This everyday meaning is then used as a simile for liberation, like in the sentence, like the going out of a light was the liberation of a mind. And I think that quote, <clears throat> like the going out of a light was the liberation of the mind. I think that's one, from one of the poems of the early nuns, the Buddhist nuns at the time of the Buddha. I guess it was the habit then um, near your dying time, you would sum up your practice in a few verses. 
And uh, so there's a collection that's come down through the centuries of the poems of the early nuns and the early monks um, from the time of the Buddha. And that's one of the lines, like a lamp going out was the liberation of the mind. So there's something there, greed, anger, and delusion, and it goes out. They cease. There's grasping, self-centered grasping, and that activity releases or goes cool or goes out. That's why one of the nice, I think, nice definitions of what we're practicing for, this is from Achan Cha, one of our great teachers in the last century that inspired a lot of the senior Western teachers, a Thai meditation teacher, Buddhist monk. He said the, he re describes it as the reality of non-grasping, the reality of the heart, non-grasping, the non-grasping heart, right? So it's the activity of the heart releasing all grasping. And as a more visceral quality, it's like a, I often like to use the quality of free fall. And I mentioned it can be a rocky transition from our normal mode, always viewing our experience from a self-centered point of view. I'm a suffering human being. I'm paying attention in order to get to a place where I'm not suffering. So we approach the spiritual path from the self-centered point of view, and we all start here. So the path itself is purifying the idea of what we're doing. We always start the spiritual path not having a clue, right? Like thinking that there's a me that's hurting and needs to get someplace where I'm not hurting. So hopefully on, along the path, we get some teaching that say, okay, you don't know what you're doing. So you really need to value just being awake to the way it is, Buddha knowing Dhamma. And that wakefulness, that alert and relaxed presence has to begin with no, with no idea, no expectation, no fixed views. That takes a long time, right? To learn how to, that's why we train with the breath, with bodily sensations, with hearing these ordinary experiences in the present moment. Can we be with hearing without getting lost in our thoughts about what we're hearing? Can we be with sensation without getting lost in our thoughts about the body? Can we be with the breath without, you know, thinking about our breath, but just be with the raw immediacy of breathing in and breathing out. And we break the spell and we, the, the letting go, the not, the non-dependence, the non-grasping of experience happens when we see things as they are. So nobody is ever going to let go. Letting go happens because of the intimacy, wisdom, wise, mindful presence is intimate with experience, which is changing and impersonal. And letting go happens. And then the way we know letting go happens is the activity of our lives, how we show up with our kids, how we show up with the world, it is unburdened. So it's animated by love, not animated by a neurotic person who's hurting and doesn't want to hurt. Doesn't mean we don't feel pain, but the heart isn't confused by the pain we feel. When we lose somebody we love, the heart's really going to hurt. But there won't be a grasping for that hurt to be different than it is. There won't be this idea of a somebody who feels insulted by the pain of loss or feels betrayed by the pain of loss. So I'll come back to this for at least one more week next week. Really nice to be with everybody today. And, you know, as we're getting to the end of these talks on impermanence, feel free to send in your questions and I'll incorporate them in the, the last two weeks. Um, next Sunday and then the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. And then I'm gonna be on retreat for a couple of weeks in December. But feel free to send to the center any questions you have about impermanence or just the wider 
um, study of the path, the practice, and uh, I'll incorporate them in the next two weeks. And if those of you who have my email, you can just send them directly to me too. And then Nancy is here. So everyone is welcome to would like to just to stay right here on the Zoom meeting. And uh, in about two minutes or so, once uh, other folks leave, Nancy will organize you into small groups for about 15 and 20 minutes. And then just to keep in mind, there is a day long retreat that last Saturday in November. Gabe Keller Flores and Shelley Graff will be leading the twice annual community practice intensive. We do it every December and every June. So that's coming up in a few weeks. And then finally, Win Fricky, Shelley Graff and I, and I think Stacy McClendon will be helping out. We'll be teaching the year end retreat and that's Sunday evening, the 27th of December until 12 noon on the 31st of December. And that registration will go out probably this week or at the latest next week. Nice to be with everybody today. Have a good week.